Now, the time of COVID, we are always in a spree of web near, but this is and thanks to the Critical Indian Society for Critical Care Medica uh, Medicine for arranging this kind of academic CME for all of us, the healthcare professionals, taking into consideration the uh, healthcare assistant, the nursing staff, which is a part of an important pivot of critical care unit. And I must uh, say my thanks to the critical care team and Dr. Shushud Bandhapadhyay, who is taking a lot of pain in arranging this thing. Anyway, first of all, let me tell you that it should not be a didactic lectures. It should be interactive because here we should learn something which is practical oriented. I'll not tell you something very big theory, very big things about uh, ventilation and all these things. I want to discuss the basic thing which is very much into our day-to-day -day practice. Now, before starting it, I uh, once I was asked that who runs the critical care unit, my answer was basically there are two groups, which uh, with due respect to all my fellow colleagues, seniors and juniors, that it is run by basically two groups. One is the nursing team and another is the physiotherapy and respiratory therapist because it is they who are present all the time. The doctors, yes, they also take part in diagnosing, planning treatment and implementing treatment. But if you ask in a critical care unit, these two, two group of people who are there all the time in the critical care unit giving that toil to help us to treat the patient and thereby sending them back home in a healthy state. So it's a team effort and being part of the team, I want to discuss this in unison with the, all the panelists, uh, all the participants along with all the panelists. At any point of time, if you feel to stop me, you are allowed to do so because we want to interaction and understand the subject. Okay. So the topic is care of the ventilator patient. I put it in a different way. Nursing issues, I put it in this way, in a mechanical ventilated situation and the ventilator troubleshooting. So that's, that's a more, uh, uh, I make it simpler rather than put it broad. Now, uh, I think, uh, if the slides are not changed, please let me know. Okay, now it's nine o'clock. Take it, not five in the evening. It is nine in the morning. So we are in the ICU round. So patient is on ventilation. Take a hypothetical situation. There are many who have been in the morning round today in their ICU and find the patient is on ventilation. The first thing, what you see, is the status of the sedation. The patient is awake or the patient is still sleeping. Whether the patient is comfortable on ventilator, that the patient is on ventilator, whether the patient is fighting with the ventilator or he or she is trying to communicate with the consultant who is on round and the healthcare team associated there who are taking part in his or her care. Whether the parameters are acceptable, the pulse, blood pressure, saturation, PO2, FiO2 ratios, urine output, whether these all the parameters are acceptable. If, all, if the patient is not on sedation and comfortable on ventilator, the parameters are acceptable, then we have time to discuss about the ventilation. So any active intervention is required at this moment? If it is not, Thank God, we have got some time, at least 30, 40 minutes to discuss. But before that, let's check whether the PEP bundle is in place. 
So this is one thing before you are comfortable talking something for 30 minutes. You should make sure that the team makes the patient comfortable and keep the VAP bundle in place. So what is VAP bundle? So it is the elevation of the bed between 30 to 45 degree at all time until contraindicated. What do you mean by contraindication? If the blood pressure is too low, then you cannot put this. Otherwise, put it over there. Cross check whether deep venous thrombosis profile axis is in place or not. Check the medicine card. Whether the peptic ulcer disease and selective gut decontamination is in place. Whether you interpret the sedation, the sedation break, whether you have given it. Whether the patient is on winning protocol, whether you have put the patient on spontaneous breathing trial. So in the morning round, you come and see if the patient is otherwise acceptable. You put the patient on spontaneous breathing trial, whether the oral care has been taken properly or not, whether the mouth is cleaned or whether there is any dark crust or bleeding in the mouth. So if all these things is in place, now we are comfortable. So let's go through. Before understanding what we should do, let's go to the library to read something about the ventilation and ventilation associated situation. I'll spend only seven minutes for it. So basic law of physics. I, uh, uh, what is the basic law of physics? The air always flows from higher pressure to lower pressure. And if there is a tube, there will be no flow of air if the two pressure is equal. And flow of gases depends on the resistance it best, and picking up pressure depends on how quickly the peak flow target is achieved. If you want to give it fast, it will reach the peak flow fast, and if you want to give it slow, it will pick up slowly. So for practical purpose, respiratory tract assumes a tube where one side is the mouth cavity and the other side is the alveoli. So if there is a pressure gradient, the air will flow inside. So depending on this pressure gradient, we formulate and use the terminology negative pressure. That means when the alveolar pressure is on the relatively negative side than the oral pressure, we call it a negative ventilation. And when the alveolar pressure is positive in comparison to the pressure of uh, your mouth cavity, we call it a positive pressure ventilation, right? So uh, rather, uh, Alveolar pressure is not positive even if it is zero. And if, the, if you put a positive pressure that you are forcing the air through the mouth cavity to the alveolus, we call it positive pressure ventilation. So what is ventilator? Ventilators are specially designed pump. Nothing else. It's an instrument which support the ventilatory function of the respiratory system. The respiratory system has got many functions. One of the function is ventilatory function. So what is the ventilatory functions? It improves the oxygenation and wash out of carbon dioxide, which is reflected in every day's arterial blood gas report. What is the oxygen level in how much if I would, and what is the carbon dioxide level in that gas, and what is the pH? So the function of ventilator is plain and simple. It removes carbon dioxide and gives oxygen. <laughs> Mechanical ventilation <laughs> provides warm humidified gases and ventilator acts as a source of inspiration by replacing the work of diaphragm and inspiratory muscle. That's the crux. So it gives oxygen, takes out carbon dioxide, and support the muscles of respiration. So either these three are in problem. We call it in mix and match way, respiratory failure. And we use the terminology type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, depending on these four variables. That when you have got low carbon oxygen, type 1, when you have got low oxygen along with high carbon dioxide, it's type 2. When you have got problem in the respiratory muscle, 
there is a weakness in the respiratory muscle, we call it type 3, and when it is associated with the post-surgical situation, where respiratory excursion is inhibited or halted by any operative scar in the upper abdomen, which are stage stage 4, I mean respiratory type 4. So normal pressure, what is the normal pressure? It's a negative pressure effort. That means the alveoli has got negativity. Air in the mouth, it is zero. So the pressure, air goes, that is air sucked in. So this is the normal respiration. So I think normal respiration, you are all aware. So initial ventilator was negative pressure ventilators. Why? Because normal physiology tells us to take respiration in a negative way. Right? Now, Later, intermittent positive pressure ventilator was introduced. The first negative pressure ventilator was described by John Dalzell, a Scottish physician. I'm not going into details of history. I think you can read it out. So this is the basic iron lung, which is a negative pressure ventilation, which has been used extensively in polio epidemic in mid 50s. So you are quite aware of this thing. So uh, who invented and all this theory, I'm just skipping it off. Now, first, of, what is positive pressure ventilation? When the pressure of the at, uh, mouth is above the atmospheric pressure, so the pressure is pushed, the air is pushed into your alveoli by giving force. We call it, it's not sucked in. It is forced from the mouth cavity to the alveoli, one part of the tube to another part of the tube. We call it a positive pressure ventilation. So what should be an ideal ventilator? What is the advantage of ventilators? They do not talk. We only talk. And the ventilators only hear our orders. So it should be reliable, having good alarm setting. At least the ventilator should talk. So what I have told, the ventilator does not talk. That does not, that makes a yes man, but that does not make a good man. So we want a ventilator who talks. And how the ventilator talks? The ventilator talks through alarms. It goes off, alarm goes off, ventilator is talking, please come, please come, take care of me. High capability, that is in volume, pressure, and flow. So you can maneuver within this volume, pressure, and flow. Versatile, there will be different modes Handy and small, it should be uh, portable. That ventilator should take him here. Now in a COVID patient, that patient will require ventilator. Okay, take the ventilator and run. So that's the thing. So handy and small, and it should be user friendly. There should not be too much of jargons. Go there on the right side, then go to the left, left and up, up to down, and then you have it. No, it should be user friendly. You press a button and the job is done. That's how. The idle ventilator should work. Provision for disposable circuit should be there. It should be inexpensive. That is the bottom line. Even if you use uh, it, it should not spend too much. Acceptable to the physicians and the patient should have a battery backup. That is very important because sometimes they are maybe probably not in a state of art institute, but in lesser institute, you may have a risk of developing power cuts. So you should have a battery backup. So the cut, power cut does not happen, a life cut to the patient. So you should have a battery backup. Easy for servicing and sterilization and can be upgraded by simply changing or incorporating softwares. So a ventilator is there, you, even with that same ventilator, you can upgrade it by introducing some software. Okay. So ideal ventilator design is that this uh, all these things. Now basic things about ventilators. For every action, if you if you if you go through the playing of chess, chess has a opening game, middle game, and end game. Like that, ventilator should have three factors. One is triggering factor, one is cycling, and what is limiting factor. Unfortunately, we are in a era of web near, so I cannot ask anybody any questions over here, but I, I'm i itching to ask somebody that what is trigger, do you have any idea? I'll be asking one question after ending this thing. That is, 
triggering factor which initiates the ventilation. So when the ventilation starts, if it is a time trigger, the time after each time, the ventilator is triggered and the ventilator gives a certain volume. If it is a flow trigger, after developing, attending each flow, the ventilator triggers. And if it's a pressure, pressure trigger, whatever, achieving a certain amount of pressure, it, it, it triggers the ventilation. So the, it's the starting point of ventilation is called trigger. Cycling means whether you want to cycle it with volume, pressure, or time. That after delivering, say, volume, 500 ml of volume, the ventilator will stop and it will go to the expiratory mode. If the pressure, if 20 pressure is the set pressure, after attending 20 pressure, it will go back to the expiratory mode. And the limiting factor, there must be a head teacher to everything. Whenever you do works, you should not go overboard. You cannot be Birat Kohli on field. The umpires are there to cut you short. So if you have a tidal volume goes too much, there should be a limiting factor, like a pressure or uh, something, which will prevent the tidal volume to go overboard, even if the patient is taking a huge amount of inspiratory effort. So that is called the limiting factor. So this is the three things. And limiting factor also help in controlling the ventilation. Now my question comes, uh, uh, I'm sorry that I didn't put it in an MCQ format. So my question comes, what is a normal respiration? How it is triggered, how it is cycled, and how it is limited? So if anybody has got the answer, you can, uh, I'm not giving you MCQ, I can put it in this very simple way. Uh, I'm not complicating the thing. It is a time trigger, time cycle, time limited mode, volume trigger, volume cycle, volume limited mode, flow triggered, flow cycle, flow limited mode, or you may have none of the above. So you can write down the options and somebody uh, can check it. I can give you only 10 seconds to write down the option. Time, volume, flow, and none of the You can have that. So hopefully you are watching my slides. So if 10 seconds is over, then I can... Uh, uh, I don't know whether... Uh, Sobna is talking, but I cannot hear Sobna. Sobna, are you talking? Or... Yeah. So I am giving them 10 seconds. Uh, so after that, I'll be coming to the slides with the answers, basically. My next slide is the answer. So uh, this is a normal respiration is flow triggered. That means flow triggers the way ventilation, flow limited, flow cycle. Like if you cry, go on crying, go on crying after, after some time, you have to suck in. So that is a certain, after a certain flow, you have to take a respiration. So that is a flow trigger. Flow limited, after attending some flow, you have to stop taking the breath and it is flow cycle. Cycling is also by flow. Now let's see. This is that the flow and the pressure. The pressure is generating the flow, and you see this comes to the best line. Now we have set a pit. We have set a pit, and you see this line is increasing. That means if I stop over here, there was the best line is at zero when you have incorporated five pip. So the best line has increased to the height of five. So this is how whenever you set and you, you have the uh, graph with you, you can understand what you are setting. And this is the pressure where you have put the limitation. If you want to limit the pressure, you can reduce the pressure. The peak pressure is 35. You can reduce it to, say, 25. So 
after attaining this amount of pressure it will be limited and it will be going to the expiration so this is the inspiratory point and this is the expiratory point so you can see this is the end of inspiration if the expiration starts okay again inspiration triggered expiration like the same way the inspiration and expiration goes on so what is the indication of mechanical ventilation so mechanical ventilation when the uh, oxygenation is not there or carbon dioxide washout is not there this is the very easy answer to it so when there is a problem of oxygenation what is the problem of oxygenation severe respiratory tract infection prototype is covid covid pneumonia irds pulmonary edema pulmonary hemorrhage pulmonary embolism and hypercarbia when you cannot excrete uh, i mean check out the carbon dioxide that is alveolar hypoventilation acute exacerbation of copd with respiratory fatigue respiratory muscle fatigue in other form of obstructive airway disease neuromuscular weakness like ulen body syndrome myasthenia poliomyelitis apart from that there are some other indication like reduced cerebral edema in increased cerebral intracranial pressure acute left ventricular failure while we want to reduce the preload to protect the airway from the chance of aspiration there probably we do not need ventilation but only airway protection while the cuff flex is poor selected post operative cases when we want the patient to be sedated and ventilated so that nothing happen to the basic operation nothing wrong happen to the basic operation right goals of mechanical ventilation so primary goals of mechanical ventilation is to give good amount of oxygen wash out the carbon dioxide and give the patient adequate rest that is reduce the work of breathing and optimize the patient's comfort now the modes of ventilation are uh, uh, while i'll be showing you the ventilators i'll be talking about the modes of ventilation the modes of ventilation the definition is a set of operating characteristics that controls how the ventilator will function that means how it will be triggered how it will be cycled and how it will be limited so that makes the mode of ventilation ha uh, so this is what we call it the uh, mode has got three component so one is the control variable where you can control that's the pressure or volume the breathing sequence whether it's continuous mandatory or intermediate mandatory and targeting scheme that means what you want to target how much total volume you want to give what to how you want to set the inspiratory time or the total time of respiration or ie ratio how you want to set the fio to p and the flow triggering so this is a ventilator how it looks like always remember that three things about starting a ventilation and the respiratory the total team should know first of all in each ventilation there is the parameters basic parameters remains the same the but the working way of that parameter may be different there are different switch like a ventilator in some ventilator you have to uh, increase and attain the working pressure otherwise the ventilator will not work previously the siemens ventilator used to have a backup working pressure even that working pressure is not reached you may think that ventilator is at fault and it is not working so you have to know the nitty gritty the mechanics and physics of ventilation and the ventilator machine number 2 how to do self testing some of the ventilator works only when you do the self test like this uh, pre written vent and ventilator there is a switch in, on the back side you have to press simultaneously to carry out a self test and once the ventilator is working then you set the ventilator like this set up like whether you you enter the body weight of the patient whether you want to give invasive or you move this uh, knob to make it non invasive because this type right now the ventilators are used both for invasive and non invasive then what kind of uh, setting you want to give is a uh, volume control simv 
or volume control, pressure control, like that. It's a access control, SIMB, spontaneous or pressure support mode. You just keep on taking the mode. Then there should be an alarm system where you want to set the alarm. On, on the base, there's a locking system. You can disarm the alarm, how you can uh, disarm the alarm for how much time. And there are two pause buttons. One is an inspiratory pause and one in an expiratory pause. When you press the inspiratory pause button, the patient's inspirate, that is an inspiratory hold of breathing. And thereby you can understand the compliance and resistance of the right. And when you hold the expiratory portion of the ventilation time, that's the expiratory pause. When you incorporate expiratory pause, it will tell you how much intrinsic or auto PIP is generated and how much the total PIP, the PIP and the auto PIP makes a total PIP. So how we will check it? Because the team, what is auto PIP, what is PIP? That's a theoretical conjecture. And primarily the physicians uh, decides how much PIP to give and when to give, how to give. But the team which nurse the patient, the respiratory therapist, the nursing team should know which button they should push to understand the compliance and resistance. They should know which button they should press to understand the PIP and the auto PIP and the total PIP in the system. Now the basic modes of ventilation is volume control, pressure control, SIMB, SIMB with pressure support, and pressure support ventilation. These are the basic mode of ventilation. Now, just have a look. So you have said that the option SP, SIMB, on, and, and uh, this is uh, uh, the pilot. Now you, you just go and set whether it's pressure control, pressure support, you set individual things one after another. Okay, so you, you can you can you can uh, do like the pressure control in access control mode. You put it in the pressure control. and if you are the patient in an invasive mode. And now this is a situation where you check the alarm. So you have set the patient in a pressure control ventilation, right? It is it is a volume control ventilation ventilation which is showing in the uh, your screen. Now, what alarm you should give? In volume control means it will be cycle. It, is, it will be cycle after 440 ml of volume. So it is the volume you are controlling, but what you are not controlling, the generation of peak pressure. So you have to keep the peak pressure alarm in such a way that there should not be any barrel trauma. So you put the peak pressure alarm, suppose, at 90. Okay, the ventilator will not give alarm. The ventilator is a quiet ventilator, very good ventilator. They do not talk too much. But what will happen? There will be a generation of 80, 85 peak pressure and suddenly you find the patient develop hypotension, tachycardia, and in no time, if you do not see the patient, attend the patient, then and there, patient develop cardiac arrest. What happens? There is a development of pneumothorax. So, you have to put the alarm in such a uh, uh, value that it alerts you before it's too late. Okay, so the alarm should be set in this way. Now you uh, set an upper alarm, a lower alarm. What is why you need to put a lower alarm? Suppose you give a pressure control ventilation, yeah, you are not generating an adequate amount of tidal volume, and the minute volume goes below five liters. So if you do not put the minute volume alarm, the lower one at five liters. What you will get? After some time, you will find the patient who retained carbon dioxide. So the alarm setting, alarm setting is basically done by the doctors, but for the nursing and the respiratory therapist, always respect the alarm. Do not disarm the alarm each and every time. So I'm now skipping this thing. This is theory. Uh, this is I'm not going into the theory business. Uh, this is the, all the things. Play to pressure. Uh, 
This is another, there is a cup. Uh, this I want to show later, later if I get time to discuss. I just want to skip this one. Okay. Now, why, how the ventilation set, setting is started? The FiO2 initially was given at 100% respiratory rate average, was kept around 12. It depends on whether you want to wash out carbon dioxide, then you made it 20. The tidal volume is 6 ml per kg, kg body weight. In India, the situation is between 420 to 480, uh, 450 ml. Inspiratory pressure should be kept around 30 to prevent barotrauma. High ratio, normally 1 is to 2 or 1 is to 3. Give more time for expiration so that there is no air trapping. PIP, you set according to the situation if you are uh, treating a heart failure patient to set PIP at a higher level and in COPD and asthma or a patient who is having hypotension, you set the PIP at a lower level. Triggering, when it's flow triggered, more sensitive, the patient will breathe more with the ventilation and there may be tachypnea and then may be patient ventilator at dyssynchrony. So according to the oxygenation, your target saturation, target PO2, will uh, uh, determine how much FiO2 you want to give and what is the variable and what are the alarm setting you need to do. Now, assessment on the nursing point of view, assess the patient, whether the patient is fighting or whether the patient is comfortable on ventilation. Assess the artificial airway. Airway is the basically lifeline of ventilation. If the airway is not in place, that means the airway came out of the trachea or in the mouth cavity. In a normal ventilation, probably it does not happen that much. But in prone ventilation, you have to make sure you secure the airway properly. Otherwise, in prone ventilation, suddenly you will land up with trouble. Because most of the patients on prone ventilation, we sedate and put, make the patient relax show there is no respiratory effort and the patient cannot say that he is in problem. So the securing airway is very important. And assess the ventilator, that you are habituated with the switches of the ventilator, that you should know what to do, the FiO2, where is the tube connected, whether there is any loosening in the tube. You should know your ventilator before you know your patient because the ventilator is an instrument which helps the patient. And make sure whenever there is a ventilator, when you are on a duty, you ask how much is the battery backup. If the battery backup is not there or only for 10 minutes, then if there is any power cut, make sure that you arrange for the uh, replacement of ventilation. And for practical purpose, all ventilation Ventilator machine should have a bend circuit by the side. If, because ventilator, ventilator patient in uh, what we call in anesthesia, uh, it's a type 4 circuit. That's magnet, uh, the normal, the, uh, your ammo bag is basically a type A, and uh, the bend circuit is basically type D anesthetic circuit. So anesthesia people will know it was better. This is just for a theoretical jargon. If somebody wants to give uh, MCQ on this, they are welcome. Now, what nursing intervention is required? Maintaining the airway potency and oxygen. Make sure the saturation is all right. There is no sound in the airway. So the airway potency is maintained. And as and where required, you do suction. Promote comfort. Do not make the patient uncomfortable on ventilation. Communicate with the patient if the patient is conscious or look at the other sign where you can understand the patient is in comfort. The fluid and electrolytes should be checked and to be communicated with the treating team. And if there is any discrepancy with the help of treating team, try to correct it. Make sure the nutritional state is well uh, taken care of and the nutrition is well maintained. 
the urine of food and bowel elimination should be looked into care of the eyes a ventilator patient care of the eyes is very important especially those patients who are on non invasive ventilation the air can cause redness in the eyes so that is very important and maintain the mobility and the musculoskeletal function maintain the safety the electrical safety the psychological support try to communicate and try to push the patient psychologically and the important thing is that respond to ventilator alarms do not put it in silence do not put it in silence that is the most important thing if the ventilator is talking too much i i know that nobody uh, likes a talkative person if the ventilator becomes too much talkative do everything but don't mute the ventilator that's my request to you all in folded hands now the other things that prevent nosocomial infection and document whatever you are doing document it now responding to alarms i think the healthcare professional the biggest thing in a ventilator patient is responding to the alarm you will find it is blinking red just blinking red that means some alarm is going on if there is an alarm sound check for what the alarm is going on if there is a low oxygen if the tidal volume is not adequately delivered whether the minute volume is not achieved or the patient is giving too much of minute volume whether the peak pressure is going too high and whatever be the things you go for the troubleshooting and go for the checklist like a pilot like an experienced pilot go for the checklist and correct it all the treating member and patient care member the nursing staff the respiratory therapist must respond to every ventilator alarm and alarm must never be ignored or disturbed now ventilator malfunction i'm not talking about the patient malfunction or something first i'm coming to the machine itself because we know list about the machine ventilator malfunction is a potential serious problem because it's a machine and machine can malfunction at any point of time so you have to identify the machine is malfunctioning or may malfunction with certain tid bits like it's beeping the electric circuit is going up and down connection disconnection connection disconnection that means that there is some problem you and you alert your facility team and the team who are responsible for taking care of the machines when device malfunction manually ventilate the patient and ask somebody to check the ventilator so if the ventilator if you think it's malfunctioning disconnect the patient take the patient's care with vent circuit either replace this ventilator with another or ask the specialist who knows about the ventilation to take care of the ventilators now the high pressure cause of ventilator alarms high pressure alarms goes off when when the patient become talkative when there is increased secretion peak ventilator tubing patient biting the et tube water in the ventilator tubing and into the the endotracheal tube is going uh, in a single lap so the last one you cannot decide high pressure alarm activate the medical team and by that time you check thinking whether the patient is conscious and biting and fighting with the ventilator whether there is water in the tubing or whether there is any increased secretion you just suck but before that you inform the treating team low pressure alarm why there is a low pressure alarm first of all there may be cough leak whenever there is a low pressure alarm take care and hear some sounds in the mouth cavity whether there is a gurgling sound in the mouth coming so the cough is leaking so inflate the cough and ask the medical team to take care and check the cough if required you change the tube a hole in the tube rare phenomenon but it can happen disconnection to the tube another thing which is important whenever there is a low pressure just check the cough because if the cough leaks 
So that will be the first reflex. Check the cup, not the tube. Because if the cup flicks, there is a chance of aspiration. So one of the major indication of airway protection will be defeated if the patient aspirate. Once you are confirmed there is no cough leak, check for a disconnection. If there is a disconnection, these are the two things you can uh, settle, settle without the help of the medical team. But if the cough is constantly leaking, you have to change it. Or there may be change in the humidifier or in any part of the connection. If the oxygen alarm is there, there is insufficient oxygen supply or it is not properly connected, Again, ask the facility to check out. Temperature alarm overheating is a problem because in critical care unit, you need the temperature to be kept on a particular level. Now, you have taken uh, the check the back bundle. You have taken the SBT daily position of the head airway care. You have taken proper suctioning and infection control bundle in place, and you have checked the hemodynamics. Everything is fine. Now, you check the nutritional care, whether nutrition has been given adequately, whether this patient is recovering and put on a winning protocol. Check your documentation and put the patient on winning protocol. Communicate with the relatives. Mostly the medical team communicates with the relative in conjunction with the nursing and the respiratory therapy team that how the patient behaves last 24 hours on ventilation, whether he or she is comfortable or whether they have fight with the ventilators with often disconnection they he or she tried to pull out the tube on and of course assure the patient that you will be extubated one day and don't forget to take care of the skin and other important issues because a ventilator patient we often tell the patient not to move too much and it causes some kind of pressure show uh, nutritional care. Oh my God. Now the sedation scale, you just, you, the nursing team has got a sedation scale in their daily rounds. If awake, ramps, uh, if awake, now put it in the, 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 the Ramses scale, that is one, two, three, two, six. The six is no response to light, clavular tap, or loud. So this will be a code language that how, uh, what is the Ramses score? So if the patient is awake, out of one, two, three, and if the patient is sleeping, four, five, six, right? The pain assessment tool can be used in nursing table for that. Now, I'm not talking about non-invasive ventilation, so I can skip this. Ventilator at fault, I have told what to do, Ben circuit. Now, ventilator troubles shooting, Protect the patient. Solve the ventilator problem is the job of the facility. But your job is to protect the patient, ensure the patient's safety, put the patient on bend circuit. When alarm is triggered, check the patient fast. <clears throat> Look for the consciousness, work of breathing, saturation, pulse rate, whether there is any sweating, Check the blood sugar if required. Check the alarm that whether it has been disarmed or not. Play to pressure and this, this is, this is, I'm not discussing. Okay. Now, identify the patient is in distress. So how, how you will identify? We'll suddenly find a comfortable patient suddenly start fighting with the ventilator. There may be patient ventilator asyn asynchrony. And what will be the sign? There will be sudden tachycardia, diaphoresis, a lot of use of accessory muscles. So what is the cause of sudden respiratory distress? It can be due to the disease states. It can be due to patient ventilator dyssynchrony. What are the causes of patient? Uh, the disease state is to be treated. You have to inform the doctors. They will take care of the disease state. But in the meantime, you should see there is any airway problem or not, whether there is a bronchospasm, whether there is secretion, whether there is development of pulmonary edema reflected by frothy sputum coming out through a tube, whether DVT prophylaxis in 
place, the doctor may search for a pulmonary embolism or dynamic hyperinflation. And due to abnormal body positioning, the patient may fight with the ventilation. Pneumothorax. And not to forget the anxiety state. Now, what are the uh, ventilator-related issues which can cause this systemic leak, low FiO2, disconnected circuit? Now, improv uh, the setting will be always checked by the medical team. You just check out whether the same setting exists or it has been changed by somebody. Okay. Now, the patient ventilated dysynchrony, I'm not coming to the uh, curve, so uh, leave the curve. It will make that thing more complicated. Patient desaturating, what will you do? First, check the patient. The patient is desaturating. The, for the timing, you increase the FiO2 and check, go for the checklist. Whether the patient is in any trouble medically, like heart rate has increased or decreased, there is ectopics coming, the blood pressure may fluctuate, blood pressure may go too high or too low. Whether the patient is coughing and the patient and uh, ventilator is in asynchrony, check the oxygen supply. That is very important, whether oxygen is coming properly or not. And if the oxygen supply is all right, you increase the FiO2 for the timing to uh, uh, fix the problem of desaturation, then you find out the cause and fix it permanently. Common patient-related problem, which leads to a drop in saturation, airway problem, king titty tube biting, king titty tube or biting by a conscious patient, displacement of the tube to more deep, rupture of an artery or uh, something, so some disease process. Pneumothorax is another important thing. You just, uh, with the help of the doctors, if you uh, auscultate the patient, you will find less air entry in one side to diagnose a pneumothorax. Whether there is bronchospasm, if there is a bronchospasm with the uh, permission of the doctor treating team, you just give the bronchodilators, and if there is any secretion or frothing, you just suck it out after giving adequate oxygenation to get it back in the old state. Now, patient-related problem which leads to this kind of desaturation, pulmonary edema, acute development of pulmonary edema. It can be cardiogenic, it can be non-cardiogenic. There may be dynamic hyperinflation, like a huge amount of autopip has been developed leads to a drop in blood pressure and drop in saturation. There may be a development of pneumothorax and <clears throat> the treatment of uh, uh, I mean, dynamic hyperinflation is to disconnect the tube, release the autopip and reduce the ventricular, uh, I mean, tidal volume and make the IP ratio optimum to achieve a good amount of carbon dioxide washout. Now, abnormal respiratory drive may be there in neurological dis disorder or neurological blockage. Apart from that, which is important, is the pain, anxiety, peripheral, uh, I mean, uh, neurological problem, which can give rise to this kind of problem. Uh, uh, pulmonary embolism is another cause. Now, ventilator-related problem, there may be leaks in the calf circuit, inadequate oxygen, inadequate ventilator support. You have not given the adequate parameters. The sensitivity is not optimum. And the flow setting, flow setting should be made perfect. Otherwise, there will be air starvation. And autopip, what we have developed, we have discussed. So, this is the alarm. If the alarm goes on, you put the press the alarm button and see which one is going red and take care of that. Now, the normal alarm setting, what is the normal alarm setting, tidal volume, high alarm at uh, 200 ml 
above the setting. So if you set for practical purpose 400, so high alarm should be set at 600, low alarm should be set at 300. Pressure, whatever is the set pressure, keep it more than 10 and less, the lower one is less than five. So you can understand. Respiratory rate, high respiratory rate is more than 10 of the set rate and the low respiratory rate is less than five of the set rate. Flow, <clears throat> if the high flow setting is two liter and above, and the low flow setting two liter below the flow. So if you if you if you if you set a flow say forty five, so the high flow alarm should be set around say forty seven to fifty, and the low flow alarm should be set around forty three to forty. The apneic time more than twenty seconds. That means for time. Three breaths per minute is the maximum allowable apnea if it is more than, but in particular places, it is the institutional drive. There is no hard and fast rule that apneic alarm should be set at 20 seconds. In an institution where you have got a different uh, kind of practice, you can set the apneic alarm at 15 seconds. And if I have to alarm 5% above the setting and 5% below the setting. Common alarm situation, low pressure alarm. So this is, we have discussed time and again. Now let's come to the troubleshooting, um, troubleshooting part, uh, 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 leave it, leave it. Unexpected ventilator response. Now, if there is increased tidal volume alarm, what will you, you ask yourself? Is the patient demand increased? If the answer is yes, check the increased ventilator tidal volume alarm situation. Is ventilator is auto triggering? If the answer is no, fine. If the answer is yes, Check the sensitivity setting and set the sensitivity. And check the mandatory minimum front uh, ventilation setting so that it cannot have an auto trigger. Auto trigger is that means the flow trigger is changed into some other trigger mode. And just you check the sensitivity point. Whenever there is an increased tidal volume, Always remember, this is a common thing, and the sisters and the respiratory therapist becomes very much compliant. Ah, the patient is on nebulizer circuit is connected, so the tidal volume is increased. So make sure that yes, the nebulizer circuit is connected, the tidal volume will give an increased value. So what will you do if it is a yes? Keep a close eye on the patient till nebulization is finished. Now, the worst part is, is the flow sensor malfunctioning? Clean, you just, if you suspect this, you call the facility. And in the meantime, you put the patient on bench circuit. Is the alarm set is too low? Adjust the alarm setting properly. Okay, so... This is how you should go about. Low pressure, low PIP, low tidal volume. First, you check if the patient is disconnected. Yes. Before that, what I have told you, check leak in the circuit. Check your ear and check leak in the circuit. Repair the leak, number one. If the patient is disconnected, reconnect with the patient. If there is cough leak, you just cough and change the cough. If the proximal airway pressure Line obstructed, either secretion or due to some reason or pinching, pinch cock effect of the bed or the machines. You just clear the line. If the flow sensor is malfunctioning, again, if flow sensor is malfunctioning, suspect, call the facility, connect, and go about it. Alarm set inappropriate, reset the alarm properly. High pressure alarm, high peak alarm. So this is the commonest way 
the ventilator talks to the nurse and the respiratory therapist. High pressure, high people now. Whether the artificial airway is completely or partially obstructed. If yes, change or clean the artificial airway. If the patient is coughing, check it. If the coughing is there, see for the cause of coughing and alleviate the tension. If there is any separation, suction the secretion and do relevant cleaning if it is required. Okay. If the sub, uh, circuit is obstructed, make the circuit trap has been removed. If the ET tube is bitten, that means the patient is biting, conscious biting the ET tube. If the, it is, the patient is biting, you used a mouth guard or a bite block. If the position of Artificial airway is altered that you are pushing the airway too deep, reposition the airway. Is the, the, I mean, compliance and resistance of the circuit increased? How do you, how do you do that? By pressing the inspiratory pause. If yes, then assess and correct secretion, bronchospasm, mucosal lymphedema, worsening of the disease process, whether there is an acute development of pulmonary edema, whether there is any pneumothorax or pleural effusion. So pneumothorax and pleural effusion, these are the two things you have to do a check x-ray. But you have to take a decision in consultation with your consultant. Patient developing sudden hypotension with due saturation. Check clinically for the worsening of the patient clinically. Whether the uh, disease cause increase the fluid. What will you do if there's a hypotension? If the situation is such that the patient is volume, uh, volume uh, depressed. So you just give volume. Whether the PEEP is too much, you decrease the PEEP. Check out for auto PEEP. Push uh, the expiratory pause and check out for auto PEEP and adjust accordingly. And whether there is any gross patient ventilator dissing problem. Now, the same thing. Uh, so, if there is a high PEEP with hypotension, these are the four checks you have to do. If the patient is breathing asynchronously, then make sure the synchrony gets back. The commonest cause of asynchronous breathing is pain and anxiety. The auto -peep is present, disconnect the circuit and relieve the auto -peep. The exhalation valve is malfunctioning, replace the valve. If the ventilator pressure is too high, reduce the pressure. If the alarm is too low, adjust the alarm. Okay. Uh, IE indicator sometimes gives some alarm. You have to make sure until IE you have changed, you have to if the volume used with a set volume is too high, decrease the volume. If the rate is too high, decrease the rate because these are the two uh, set, setting change which can alter the IE ratio. Sometimes IE ratio alteration is for targeting a type of ventilation like inverse ratio ventilation. Apneic alarm. If it's an actual apneic alarm, readjust the ventilator score. If the Alarm setting is, inappro is inappropriate, reset the alarm. Is the insensitive to the effort? Apneic alarm may be there if we put the triggering effect or the sensitivity in such a uh, value that the ventilator become insensitive. So you have to reset the sensitivity. If there is any leak, see the low pressure alarm and adjust accordingly. So these are the alarm you have to see. So the take home message, propagation of information is very important. So you have to inform your treating doctors that this, has, this, is, this went wrong. This went wrong. Watchful to all alarms. Always you have to be watchful to all alarms. Never put alarm in silent mode. Intelligence input is most important to win a battle. And you are part of that, so always 
uh, think that you are part of the treating team, so you should take care of the situation in consultation with the thing. So this is an MCQ. Uh, <laughs> pressure support ventilation with PIP. If the respiratory is same as BiPAP, what we commonly call bi-level positive airway pressure, and SIMB with PIP with respiratory rate set to zero is equivalent to the same. So there is no difference here. Yeah? And in SE and in SIMB, there is a full support and partial support. In a patient with no spontaneous breath, AC and SIMB are the same. So if the patient do not have any spontaneous support, AC and SIMB is the same. So thank you very much. I think we can take questions. Thank you, Dr. Sardar. That was an exhaustive cover of Shavana, you are not audible to me at least. I don't know whether I am audible to everybody, but your I cannot hear your voice. Hello? Uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Right now you are audible now. Uh, there were a few people who have raised hands. Uh, I don't know whether they can be unmuted. Can we have them ask their questions? Uh, I think uh, the question. Unmute them. Unmute them. Uh, I have two questions as well. What is the difference between uh, title, volume, title volume and minute volume? This is a very basic question. Anybody wants to answer from the participants? So I think uh, if we if we if we go back let's let's go back to the ventilator setting picture. So they will understand what is the difference between tidal volume. Theoretically, we'll be talking about the difference between tidal volume and the thing. You see uh, uh, this 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 alarm setting. If you see the alarm setting, you see one of the that tidal volume with each breath how much volume you are taking is the tidal volume. So in alarm, you see in the one, two, three, fourth block, there is something where 520 is the upper limit and 280 is the lower limit. So the patient is taking 475. So in each breath, the patient is taking 475 ml. So this is the tidal volume. This is the tidal volume. And in a minute, that means if you set the rate at 20, in a minute, how much liter of uh, 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 air the patient is taking is the minute volume. So minute volume means how much amount of air you are exchanging in a minute. So it comes to around 10.4 in this patient. So putting the upper alarm limit 17.5 and the lower. So you check the alarm and you'll find the two bar. One is how much you are giving with each breath and how much you are giving in a minute. So in a minute, how much volume you are giving is the minute volume, and with each breath, how much you are giving is the total volume. And the second question is that how do you diagnose a block tube? Very simple. The patient will have the increased peak pressure and there will be drop in saturation. Number three, which is important, initially there will be tachycardia followed by bradycardia. Now, what is the important? And you are not finding the patient biting or any other thing. And at times, the patient may be, uh, you know, sedated. The patient will not fight. But if the patient is somehow conscious, the patient will tell something that he or she is short of breath, do something. And whenever you put a suction catheter, what you find that there is, the suction catheter is not going freely. 
when the suction catheter is not going freely, you diagnose it as a blocked tube. Now, there is one uh, favorite question of mine in this context that uh, this is uh, the tube is not going as a blocked tube. Suppose the patient is on TPs, either in tracheostomy or in a ventilator patient in a winning mode in a TPs. Suddenly you find the patient is desaturating. So here the whole factor lies either with the patient or with the tube, not with the ventilator and ventilator circuit. So those things are gone and there is nothing anxiety state. So in this situation, if there is sudden drop in saturation, with all probability, the diagnosis of tube is blocked. So you can confirm it and how you'll find sudden drop in saturation. Initial tachy followed by brady. In fact, patient may go into an acetone at times. So what you should do at that time? A patient is on TPs. My question is very specific over here. What you should do? You will call the doctors. Definitely you will call the doctors. Suppose the doctor is 30 seconds away from you. You send emissary to call the doctor. So in this 30 seconds, how you want to utilize this 30 seconds in a patient who is on TPs? My question, and I'm putting it straightforward, TPs blocked. What will you do? A patient is on TPs, TPs blocked. What will you do? If somebody write the answer in chat uh, chat box in next 40, 40 seconds, it's most welcome. Then I will understand that whatever I have said in web near at least 5% went to the people who are hearing it. And then I'll give me some marks at least for my own satisfaction. But if I find there is no answer from that side, then I'll understand that I'm getting a big zero in this. There are a few answers. Two of them have said they will connect it to the uh, Let's say six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Brilliant. Uh, arrange, a, arrange a new tube. Ab absolutely brilliant. Manuel Ambu. Uh, uh, the person who has told Manuel Ambu, Benz, uh, okay. That's, 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 that's fine. That's fine. Okay. 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 The patient, uh, I'm putting it a little more. The doctor yet not arrived. He has suction, bend circuit during we should connect on bend. So everybody will ventilate the patient. The tube is blocked. How will you ventilate the patient? Uh, I'm putting it straight. Uh, the doctor is 15 seconds away. 15 seconds away. You have put, I put, uh, I have agreed that you put the bend circuit and you are doing your best effort in recanalizing the tube. 15 seconds, the doctors yet to arrive. You have arranged for a uh, tube replacement. What will you do? Uh, I, uh, so, unfortunately, in spite of Carb deflation, carb deflation, ah, carb deflation, smart, smart job, smart job, smart job. At least uh, I thought that I will give uh, zero marks. Probably I will, I will give one marks or two marks to me now. Carb deflation, I'll give two marks to me now. And uh, 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 oh. So I, I understand my scoring. It is two only out of 102. It is a failure in all account. So the first thing, the patient is on TPs. That means the patient is breathing spontaneously. If the doctor is 15 to 13, 30 seconds away, you have the tube in, in hand to replace it. What will you do? You just remove the tube. The patient is on spontaneous breathing. If you remove the tube, the patient will not have hypoxia because the patient has got his own effort. He will carry on for that 30 seconds. By that time, the doctor will come and decide whether the extubation state will persist or the tube will be repositioned or replaced by a patent tube. But somebody, at least... Uh, 
help me to give some marks by deflating the cup. Thank you very much. The person who at least deflates the cup. 